That's why my, my, I quoted my dad. I don't know if he had that on tape about the uh, surround yourself with the best people you can find and let them run with the ball as long as you can, but step in when you have to, you know? And that was kind of my leadership thing. I, I remember, I it, even just saying, I'm a musician, I wouldn't do that, you know? And then some girls said, of course you're a musician. Say you're a musician, for Christ's sake. What are you talking about? And you know, so I, I was still tippling, you know, doing this. I, and I had this thing where, okay, I would go and drink one beer and then, allow, and then I would walk on stage with a beer. But then I was all of a sudden in this band that was really popular, this funk band that was doing three sets a night. So, I, you know, and then one night I came off stage and it was Buzzy Linhart who was hanging out with our band. I knew he'd written a number one song for Beth. And I knew he played with Jimi Hendrix on his last album, um, and he was, you know, famous. And he grabbed my arm and he said, you're a great bass player. And I just said, and I, said I sat there, I remember this, my head just going blank for about five minutes. And I said, I'm never going to drink another sip for the rest of my life. Listen to the vibes. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Listen to the Vibes. And I have here Mr. Randy Pratt, bass player, and he's uh, got a, a band called Ruffians. And uh, the, the album is called Ruffians 2 that I just listened to. We're going to get to know him, and we're going to talk a little bit about the music and see what stories he has to tell. So, Randy, tell us a little bit about yourself. Oh, <laughs> I just did. Uh, all right. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm an old guy who's still doing it. Um, I play bass and harmonica. Uh, I got a studio in New York and I'm down here, uh, expatriate, and I'm now a resident of Nevada. I got a little, this little studio here, you know, which you can see in the background here. I can't fit the drums in here, but uh, during the lockdown, I discovered a way to, to make music with people all over the world and um, had just enough cred, probably from ca being in Cactus and knowing Carmine and stuff like that, to this guy. And, and I got some just killer guest appearances. I've, I've come across finally the, <clears throat> the singer I've been looking for my whole life, this guy, Ed Terry from Long Island, um, and uh, who I met through Bobby Rontanelli. Uh, who was in the lizards with me and uh, spent many, many, many hours playing with Bobby right now. We have telepathy now. So, uh, Ruffians 2 features Bobby on drums. Ruffians was a, is, is a project I started with my, my Emmy winning producer, Josh, I mentioned it, uh, J Josh Perel from Brooklyn, New York. And uh, I was introduced to him 10 years ago. and we have the same sense of humor. When I met him, he was into garage band stuff and punky kind of stuff. He's 10 years younger than me. Um, but I can't believe how well he's adopted to kind of my weirdo riff oriented bass first. Let me show you something. Can you see this pedal board here? Oh, man. That's my pedal setup. That's for and that. And now, the, can you see the floor? Yes. <laughs> okay. That's 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 where those sounds come from. And, and I, I generally write bass first with a drummer. Like uh, that that album was the, the tracks were recorded before I came down here to Vegas. Bobby and I spent five days um, playing to uh, headphones onto a to a different BPMs and Josh would say, okay, I got enough. Uh, and, and I just, I don't even know, how, I, I'm not a techie, so I'm just kind of winging it with the pedals, like stop it, I don't even, this might work, you know, and, and get a cool get the sound, so I can't even repeat the sounds. So I, you know, that's, that's, that's how, you know, and, and they're, they're pretty, the, the bass is pretty, the set, the tones are, are interesting, right? I mean, I, I, it's not, I haven't, I, the, I know the guy in Tool, 
has is famous for having a lot of pedals and stuff. But I got his album and it wasn't very songish, you know. I, but um, so it's the rough end stuff is what happens when you let a bass player uh, take that, tell, be the boss. I'm, I'm a <laughs> very collaborative, you know. I, 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 my father told me he was a businessman. And he's, he's, he's he, if your dad says stuff to you and you think that he's, you know, you're aware that that you're being influenced. But but he was a successful businessman, and he told me when I was a kid, surround yourself with the best people and let them run with the ball as far as they can before you have to come in and be the leader, you know, and then everybody will feel like they're part of the, you know, it'll, it'll, the morale will be good. So, I mean, I, I know what my limitations are. I think that's probably one of my biggest strengths is I know my strengths and, and, limited, and weaknesses at this point, finally. Tech stuff, I've, I've, I used to brag in New York, I have a great studio in New York, and, and they, I'm maintaining my technical innocence. And, and now one of my engineers go, I'm stuck down here and I can't get an engineer as often as I want. And my, my friend goes, how's your technical innocence doing there? And he goes, I've got to, I've got to learn how to do some little things. <laughs> like, like, so, but um, yeah, that's, uh, that's where that stuff comes from. A mir- each one is, a, each tone that I come up with is a miracle. <laughs> you got quite the ensemble to help collaborate on this album. I mean, guys that played with, Bands like Black Sabbath and White Snake and Blue Oyster Cult and Y and T. I mean, God, you get. Oh, you get great. What's that? I loved. He's. I loved the, his playing. Uh, Dave Manichetti. I met. I met him through Bobby. Bobby almost uh, was in Y and T almost when he was in the Lizards. Um, but um, I was talking. To, I said, "What is it?" He, I, in the James Brown book. That's my funk, and. I want to be where James Brown and Black Sabbath meet. That's my that's my fan. That's my quote that I always repeat. The sweet spot where James Brown and Black Sabbath meet. So, yeah, you're hearing some funk and some heavy and you know, coming out of there. You know? and, and and James Brown's book is all about this thing about be hard on the one, hit the one hard. You know, and a lot of people don't even know what that means. I didn't either. But if you notice the thing that sets Dave Manichetti apart on those solos is how how when he comes in, it's like gangbusters. That first note is hits so hard, right? Like, and, and it's uh, who else does that? I'm thinking, thinking, oh, Van Halen kind of has that to it. And then uh, I don't know, Van Halen used to watch Dave Manichetti when he did, in '78. Dave was the, that scene was dying, kind of, but he was one of the bands that was still headlining in the clubs in in, in LA and stuff like that. And, and uh, I don't know, that's a, that's a thing. And, and it's, it's a, probably a matter of like a hitting a hair sooner, you know, like a split hair sooner. But you, but the audience, but the, you feel it, you know, just like that. It's aggressive somehow, you know, and so, and so people just can't muster that somehow in their personality or something. I I, I hope I have some of it. But, um, but that's a thing. Like I will have a, a lyric I wrote on a, one of the Lizards album, down like a motherfucking ton on the one. <laughs> Benny happens he loved that. He said, I'm not I'm making that my motto. <laughs> he had it. <laughs> like well, the, the, come in and it sounds like you're rushing almost a little bit on the first, when you come in, you know. And some like John Bonham was more like behind the beat almost, which is awesome. I mean, it doesn't, you know, it's, it's not like a, there's, there's more than one way to be cool, definitely. <laughs> listening to the album, I could hear some influence from a lot of those bands back in the, the 70s and early 80s that that real bluesy singing but what's his name ed terry the singer yeah 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 man i love that voice man thank and, you I, I agree with you he, he can he can do james brown he sang with with uh whitney houston uh, madonna david lee roth uh, stevie wonder um, and he used to, he and uh, Whitney Houston's mother, um, Sissy, Sissy. Houston, mm-hmm. uh, and some other women were, used to do a lot of um, three piece backing vocal things. Uh, um, so he's, he's, he's got a lot of studio experience, but uh, live he, he and he's uh, he looks great for his age. I mean, he, he should be he should be in a touring band. I, I uh, when Vinnie Moore, you know, you did a couple songs on um, on for Ruffians, not not. 
I don't think he's on this album, but he's on the car, the, the, the Ruffians three album, Carmine's on every song as a drummer. And uh, Benny Moore's on, on at least one song on that album and stuff. And, and he immediately wanted to use Ed on a couple of the songs for his album, which just came out. I love the sound because no, the, no two songs really sound alike. Sometimes it would sound almost like Kansas was kicking in, but then Black Sabbath is kicking in at the same time. Then you get this almost a uh, uh, Frank Zappa and the Mothers kind of feel to it. And then you kind of go to a golden earring kind of feel to it. And I mean, it, it, it's an incredible album. It's refreshing to hear something that sounds original. The kooky, the, the kooky ones. That, when you say Frank Zappa, that's probably the ones I wrote the vocals to. I, I used to write all. Ed, Ed must have done fifty songs of mine before I, I heard his stuff, and I said, "I got let me get out of his way and let him because he he write so he writes cool lyrics and and they're they're edgy and in your face and badass, you know. But so are most of our favorite singers, right? So right. If you know, sometimes you feel like, should we do that or should we censor that? And it's like, fuck it, man. <laughs> no, there's no, there's no money they're gonna take away from this, right? Like, it's just... But I mean, you can you can have that sound without sounding like them. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why I'm I say not it's not trying to sound like anybody. But but at at my age, after all the music I've listened to, one thing I I've finally gotten to the place where I I trust that if I just start, I just start playing. When I'm in the studio, I, like Bobby, Bobby's, I, I would compare myself to other bass players and say how much, you know, oh, they're better, better than me. And this is the thing, Randy, you, all these guys you think are better than you, you get in a room with them and they got nothing. He said, he said, usually they're always the first one to start playing. He said, we just played for three hours and almost every riff in there was usable. So I just, I almost started to cry. <laughs> <laughs> I have to get over a lot of insecurities, and um, but I think that's probably I I, I do keep coming up. I'm a fountain of riffs. I mean, I've had people say to me like, "Why don't you try?" You know, like, so, "Well, I'm a bass player. I play riffs." You know, so um, it's interesting because Geezer doesn't really like the riffs and stuff, does he? But um, well, I mean, Jack Bruce did it. We were talking about fretless bass before. Yeah. Tony Franklin. And I'm thinking, why have I never heard a guy sound like Tony Franklin on fretless? First of all, most fretless guys are, are jazz guys because, mm -hmm. and, and they would never do the tasteless rock and roll things that Tony like swoop up the neck like that and think that that sound really wild on fretless because it's, you know, they're, they're jazz guys, they're mature. Or something like that, or, or but he does like rock, like wild rock stuff on a, on a on a fretless. Plus, I don't think I've seen another fretless guy play with a pick. I remember when we we opened for Jack Bruce. Uh, I forget what band I, I was in at the time, but um, he played a fretless. And some songs it was nice, but some songs the cream song sounded soft. It, it didn't punch enough. And Tony plays with a pick on a fretless, so it really cuts, you know. That's why yeah. that boomer stuff uh, really comes cuts through. It's, um, so he's a rock and roller on a, on a fretless, you know. And see, all these guys have been my heroes as long as I can remember. This is the music I grew up with, you know. Not nothing my parents listened to. This is stuff I drove my parents crazy with. <laughs> are, are we the first generation that's that's cooler than our kids? I don't know. I think so. <laughs> I know a lot of young people who say that. Uh, the, the, one of the guitar players that I, I use a lot, and Jesse Berlin was 19 when I met him. And I, I he was the best guitarist I'd ever played with him at that age. He turned 20 he went right after he joined our band. And, and uh, he could play, he he, he didn't like modern music. He, he, he learned, but he, he was a shredder. He played shred, but he could play it. He'd sit there and like a jukebox run through everything from Guess Who to every Led Zeppelin song and perfect, perfectly. And it's amazing when somebody can do that. Yeah, I know. He was, he said, I said, why, why do you, are you able to memorize so much and have all this? And he says, I was told I had a little autism and that it made my brain memorize better. Or something like that. He's a very shy little <laughs> elfish guy. He's like, great.
On, the, on that track, um, from the video, did you see the video with uh, that goes with the record? No, I haven't seen the video yet. Go on YouTube. There's a, we have a video up on a link on the uh, website hyperspacerecords.com, but also that has the album for free where you can listen to it. Mm -hmm. Hyperspacerecords.com, and that's the newest releases reference to. But the press is just starting to come in from the press release, but um, the reviews and stuff. But uh, Hyperspace Records Facebook page has a link to the video and to the uh, and to the website. Um, and I've everything I've ever done up there for free. I, I, I was a total clothes horse my whole playing career. It was my my closet of clothes is more impressive than my guitar collection. <laughs> um, <laughs> wearing uh, patchwork platform boots and velvet bell bottoms and long shag hair in New York City in 1983 was, it was fun to be like so long, you know, like a middle of the punk. People loved it. They, they, if you're gonna be out of fashion, you gotta be really aggressively out of fashion. And then, you know, then you're kind of cool, you know, like I can't do it halfway. <laughs> well, shoot, I must be the fashion king then. That's you are. <laughs> <laughs> now, all these years you've been playing, how do you keep coming up with new stuff like that and still have those riffs coming to you? Did you think you'd get burned out after a while? I, mean, I took a course in, in college in, in the 70s. I don't know music. I don't know chords. I don't know one chord. I don't play guitar. I, I don't no scales anymore. I mean, I probably practiced some scales when I start. I just, I just, when I practice, I just wank. I just go where my hand goes. And anyway, I took a college course by this famous jazz piano player. And he said, if you study music in college, you, you'll take a chance on ruining your creativity. Because a lot of it is memorizing so much stuff of other, pe other people's, you know, things and all these techniques and scales and stuff. When I was just starting to get interested in music, my parents got me a bass and, and I was too chicken shit to play it. And I gave it to my friend and said, you be the bass player, I'll be the singer. And I used to watch him and he played, first of all, he played with three fingers, which is, I, I picked that up from him. I got interviewed so many times and people would ask me who, who my biggest influences were. And I would say, Glenn Hughes, uh, Andy Frazier from Free and uh, uh, Tim Bogart in Cactus and, and uh, SBBA and Fudge. And then finally it struck me, no way they aren't. This guy, Jack Kelly, was your biggest influence. I didn't see another guy play with three fingers, even a jazz guy, until about five years ago. It's very unusual. Do you know, do you know Tim Bogart's playing? Are you familiar with Cactus? Yes. Big, yeah, I mean, he's awesome. and, and the, but he doesn't really write. He never, he never wouldn't repeat. He would go like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. And it's just from his riff ideas. And, and I, when I met him, when I when he reunited the Fudge and Cactus in my studio in New York, I said, you know, after Beck Roger and the Peace broke up, you should have done something like Rush or, or King Crimson or something like that. That's what you, and he said, I wish you'd been there to tell me that. I said, when you do that stuff, you don't repeat it. That's a song, that's a chorus, that's a chorus. And that's a, and he goes, yeah, I wish you'd, I wish somebody had told me that. Like people, a lot of people don't know that, that they have that. I, I think and I was very insecure about my playing uh, and it drove me to practice a lot. And uh, at one point in New York City, uh, when I could barely afford this rehearsal space, I had to be in six bands. So I would get off work at five and I would go up to the, go home and work out with weights until get up to the rehearsal space at seven and come home at two in the morning, six nights a week. And, and, I, and I had to really be in these bands or, I, or else I think I was just milking them to, for the rent, you know, or else I couldn't afford the rent of the rehearsal space. So I, you know, I, I got me to play. I can thank my friend Jack for showing me right before I even started to play that, oh, you can make up stuff and, and, and it can be weird, you know? And, and because of the guys that I like, I, I, I realized it didn't have to be melodic or, commercial it could be i wanted it to be kind of wrong like and tim boger said he later became a uh, a college professor at the base institute of technology and 
that's why I started playing six string bass because um because of him and uh he uh he said I can't listen to my old stuff anymore because it's I hear all, all I hear is wrong notes and I said Tim it's the wrong notes that we love <laughs> it's just like you know it's like there aren't really wrong notes if they're done artfully you know? so th this is uh this was my first Federa it's the fancier ones in New York can you see that yes it's uh that, that was my own headstock uh emblem idea they did that for me I, it was from Zap Comics, that the eyeball with the this guy. But this is a and all my you know the rock and roll guys there. I said, "Don't play that. That's not cool." And then and then I I would pick up a you know, four string and do it to do one of our old songs. Go, no, no, you used to do something really. What was that thing? Is yeah, that was a six string. That low note, you can't hit that on a four string. <laughs> so so. It's like these are the strings of a, of a bass. It's like, and then it's got one lower and one higher, but it goes up like a bass. It doesn't, some guys tune it like a guitar so they can hit chords like Bogart used to do that. But this is a longer scale too. It's 36 inch, so it's two inches longer. I know famous bass players who look at this and, and, and they, yeah, no, no, you know, like, they, but it's not that hard to play. It's, it's the same spacing pretty much as a, as a precision. 1960, original color. I think this cost two hundred dollars for a precision base in 1960, maybe 225 with a custom color. But they used 80, 80 year old aged maple for the neck. I don't think you can buy 80 year old maple on a ten thousand dollar base now. <laughs> um, you pick up mm -hmm. pick this up and play this and compare it to a modern precision base. I I I, I don't uh, it doesn't there's no comparison. This this but just heaven. <laughs> how, how many guitars do you have? Most of them are in New York. Um, here I have this is I, I, I swore off buying any more, but then I said, I don't have a sustainer bass. I knew the band Typo Negatives. Did you ever listen to them? I know. Well, yeah, I've I've listened to some of it. Pretty cool. It's a '90s band that that's actually good. Are they '90s? Are they? Um, they I both think they're '90s. The and the, and, the, and the, both the guitarists and the, and the bass player played Fernandez sustainer guitars. This is, this is so uncool, but these things, right? But, <laughs> but that's that's okay. Nobody nobody sees me. The nerdy tune. But um, yeah, you, you hit it, you hit it, and it, and it sustains, and with all those pedals added to it, it's an, I've got a couple of things coming up with this. So, so that I was going to buy one, and I never, I never but they didn't make a, a six string, and I was playing six string at the time. Like, and then I find out they only made 12 of them. And, and then I somehow, by some freak accident, I, I asked the company Reverb online where they sell uh, old, old guitars about, about one that they had for that it had for sale, but it had been sold like a decade before. But the guy who, who sold it somehow got my request and sent me an email. And he is the only guy in the world that does this. He 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 makes better versions of the sustainer pickup. It's pretty dramatic. And I I had a band. Um, that was a progressive uh, sci-fi sci progressive rock band. It's, it's on the, our website, uh, the band Star People. And the guitarist was a Robert Fripp uh, lover. And, and Robert Fripp used to use an Ebo with so an endless sustain on a note. It would sound almost like a violin, like, you know, just, it would, you wouldn't hear a picking, it was just the note. Would, and that, that's kind of what you can do with, with this without having, I mean, that thing was awkward. I remember, when I, when I lived in Manhattan, I really started pursuing it seriously. I, I said, anybody who has a haircut that could get that, that, that would allow them to get a normal job isn't commit, really committed enough to what they're doing. <laughs> you know, I had like the Johnny Thunders, like, uh, you know, the thing that's like, if, if you look like you could get a job on Wall Street, then you, you're, that's not, you're cheating. You know, like you're not really committed. That's not allowed. <laughs> right. Well, I say when I retired, I just let it all grow out and I said, I'm 
I won't go. It'll just have to fall out on its own. You were making a lot more money than I was, so that that was the, that was the difference. Oh, is that, that what it is? <laughs> I, I, when I said that I was working in a comic book store and and had two roommates, uh, and, and uh, you know, that, so uh, that's that's the flip side of that uh, pledge, you know. <laughs> so you still have an interest in comic books? I had an unbelievable comic book collection that was stolen from me by a roadie when I was on tour. So I don't, I don't think about them anymore. I had to, that was a karmic test of, to me. I think that comic book collection was probably worth a couple million dollars now. Now, and I got since it wasn't insured, they couldn't prove the condition, uh, which were all you know, Batman two up. Uh, Fantastic Four, one up, everything, all, and I, I just said, um, let this go, let this go. Everything's good in your life now. You, you know, you're touring, you're happy. Uh, uh, it's stuff. And I, and I remember, I remember that it was like I, I didn't have any training in that or anything, but I just like let it go. Yeah. So I, <laughs> It's, it's it's not easy to let go, but sometimes we just have to. But yeah, it, I mean, at least you're doing what you want to do in life. I'm very blessed <clears throat> to be able to not to make music with my heroes and, and be able to pay them. I can't believe that that. Um, some of the people that are that I'm playing with now. I mean, I got I got a song with on Carmine's album. It's like me, Carmine, and 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 um, Derek Sherinian from Sons of Apollo, and uh, and uh, Bumblefoot on guitar. And it's like, Randy, are you really are you really doing that? <laughs> Very good. Yeah, we were just jamming to Bumblefoot the other night. I said, what a sweet man. What a what an unegotistical. I, I, I discovered him from a DVD of Guns N' Roses and with him, not not the official one in Vegas, there's one, there's one better one. Uh, there's two two of them with him in the band. And that, I would say, I like that, that lineup. They had three killer lead guitar players who were in all, each one of them was interesting enough that it, it was cool. You know? I mean, you get a band like Iron Maiden or Jewish Priest, sometimes they, they end up sounding like not different enough that it's, when they solo, it's not, you know what I mean? Like, I, I thought that he, he's very interesting. Have you, have you seen that Sons of Apollo uh, DVD? No, I haven't seen that one. I don't know if you like Prague at all, but they, they Oh they yeah, do, I they love Prague. That's, that's the only Prague band I've seen that wears their influences of Deep Purple and Rainbow and stuff like that on their sleeves, the guys playing nasty heaven they, they do a bunch of covers at the end of this two hour live thing in bulgaria that they played during lockdown i think came out where they uh, it's a box set it's got their two albums and i don't think they're going to do any more so it's great uh billy sheehan you know is, do you know the band yeah, I mean, it's great yeah and, and uh bumblefoot played a, a fretless guitar uh, but it was unusual and, and um he plays it on, on the songs that he plays on my stuff, but he's he's just the the, the nicest person. He, no ego. They said that the '80s, and I've heard of a lot of fashion top fashion guys uh, say this: that the '80s was the last decade that had its own everything, its own style of dress, fashion, the sound, the vibe of the music, and everything. And since then, it's just been kind of mixing up this and that. And yeah. just, the people, a lot of people might disagree with that but I, I when you look at it, a complete scene where everybody dresses and the hair and everything and and and, and the, the message that's coming out of the music and stuff that they said the 80s was the last decade oh i believe uh, it i believe it i'm you know don't get me wrong you had bands that came out in the 90s like alice in chains and sound garden yeah. i mean they I, yeah. definitely had their own sound and their own message and it was kind of anti-establishment kind of music, but true. And and and, and you know. but the guy who who made the statement was a fashion designer, like a top fashion designer, and he was talking about that. But 
he said he 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 kind of it encompassed like the nineties did come out. You can identify those bands and the styles of the different decades, but the but if you'd say like they dress well, they were dressing like old hippies and yeah, old, yeah, let's just say and the long hair. So I mean they didn't they didn't come up with anything original yeah, other than universe. the music. Yeah. <laughs> And so did the 70s, and so did the 60s and the 50s, and, and then it's kind of like uh, now it's like uh, it, it doesn't it doesn't matter. No, we were the last cool generation. What can I say? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm not saying that to, to the public. I, 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 with my face, I'll there, say I, it. I'll say it. You I don't have type, to. I can type it on a on a, on a, on a, on a, on a post or something, but it's like to look there in the eye and say it. I, I, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. everybody i mean it, it, it's because all it's a, something that famously that dads would say like like you know like i don't get this crazy new stuff you know like oh yeah sure pops yeah okay yeah. Yeah. but <laughs> well how much the music has changed through the years though man and i like the fact that i'm starting to see the trend go a little backwards in some of the music when you hear the ruffians I'm curious. Do you hear classic rock, or do you hear something weird? No, I'm. Like, like I say, when I was listening to each song, I would get this vibe of, "Oh, wow, this sounds like something I'd been listening to like late '70s, early '80s." But there's, there's a, a, a kind of a. The, well, like I was telling you before, kind of a Frank Zappa kind of sound to it. I mean, not. I mean, you know, Frank, Frank changed his music all the time, but I mean, how he was very jazz and everything he did, even when he mixed two different genres of music together. And that's we, the kind we, of we feeling do, I got. We do. And, and I'm amazed that Josh is, jo, Josh does a lot of arranging, you know, of, I'll put down basic ideas and, and he's, the, um, there's a lot of, changing riffs going on a lot it's not not a, not set that simple it's, I, don't, I don't know if it, it rates as prog but so, so i would have put most of it at kind of prog because uh, you could the changes in it were were kind of odd you know not like the, the first one oh no go to the website because there's another the, the first uh ruffians album has tc tc Tolliver, the drummer from the plasmatics and Pat Travers is on every track, uh, plus that kid I told you that shred kid who, uh, uh, and Pat was psyched, psyched to play with him. And I, I knew Pat from from. He's recorded at my studio with with Carmine Carmine and um, Apathy Carmine Apathy. Uh, yeah, and, and the the lizards toured with. Travers and a Peace was a band that put out a couple of albums, uh, and Tony Franklin was the bass player. And we toured Europe. We played Russia. I remember. Uh, I remember the place. There were two gigs booked, and one of them was in Moscow. And the promoter took all the money and ran off with us, and that one was canceled. But we played St. Petersburg, which was a beautiful city. I was a little scared taking two Federa basses there, and so these two, uh, like. The equivalent of Navy SEALs from um, Denmark, from our our manager, from European manager, brought along, and you get in the middle of Russia with two tough guys, and it's like, what the hell are these guys gonna do? <laughs> like, uh, but no, no, I remember at one point after we played, I was surrounded by kids, and they and were going, can we touch the bass? You know, like oh, I've never thought I'd ever see one, and then people were crying, you know, and stuff like that, and um, and. Uh, at one point, I looked around and I go, I don't know anybody. I don't see any of my guys. And there's like 30 kids with my bass in my hand, you know, and, and, but they, they're cool. They give it back to me. And I remember when we left, there was some old, old, old guy about my age with, holding one of the posters of the gig and with tears down his face. Go, please, please come back and play again. And I told oh. him, I don't care how, if we lose money, we got to play Russia. By the time we got out of Russia, it was so we got pulled over in Armenia, like and the whole bus searched and, and we stopped at a we got lost and in, in, in the woods and I it was like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre and stuff. And I mean and, and we went into a bar and has constructions looking like you know rock star guy. And, be, and it was after the Twin Towers had come down, obviously 
and they had a velvet painting of the Twin Towers behind that bar. And we're, what does that mean? You know, I got it. And I said, you know, by the time we got out of Russia, I said, nah, we're not playing in Russia. <laughs> oh, <man>. <laughs> <laughs> Going in was cool, but getting out was rough. Um, but anyway, so so I knew Pat Driver. So he, he, he that was the beginning of, of me saying, well, I can get these all these guys to play on this stuff. And, and, and I started creating music that way, where, where we was bass and drums, and then we would have other people play, play on it. And um, bass, drums, and vocals first, which yeah. a, lot, a lot of this, which is, that, that probably gives it an, an unusual t- uh, vibe that you're not sure what you're here, why, what you're, why it's unusual, but that, I, I, I've read probably every issue of Bass Player Magazine. I can't only remember very few bassists even saying that they write on bass. All your, all your life, whether it's been in music or life in general, what's been like your biggest, biggest hurdle? My own insecurity, probably. Took me, as I, I lost a dozen years of w- wasted time being the life of the party, adorable clown, alcoholic, you know, lovable, kind of tinkering with, you know, I had a bass and I play, but I would not, my friend, I'm, and, and it wasn't until I moved into the city and said, a girl, this a girl I was going out with, was a musician and she when moving in the city I, I i moved into the city and i was competing with sid vicious instead of tim bogart all of a sudden at the perfect time perfect place perfect haircut <laughs> and i i it, but i was 27 years old you know when i started to you know like practice so you know, i should have started when i was 14 you know so um that was the biggest hurdle. And I remember I also realized at some point that I, I was going to do my own thing and I had to be the leader. And I always figured, well, the best guy in the band, like he's this guitar player, is, I always try to get better people than me, you know, uh, it, to play with. And, and I became obvious to me that guys who were had the personality to say, you got to show up four times a week. We're going to practice four hours. Um, no bullshit. No bullshitting. And, you know, we're, we're working hard while we're there. Uh, um, okay, come on. Cause, you know, let's get you know, the organized and the, and the will to like be like that. Like, uh, and yet be collaborative and not be an asshole about it. I, I, I had to do it. I didn't want to do it, you know. That's why my that quote of my dad is, I don't know if you had that on tape about the uh, surround yourself with the best people you can find and let them run with the ball as long as you can, but step in when you have to, you know, and that was kind of my leadership thing. I, I remember I it, even just saying I'm a musician. I wouldn't do that, you know, and then some girl said, of course, you're a musician. You say you're a musician for Christ's sake. What are you talking about? You know, so I. I was still tippling, you know, doing this. I, and I had this thing where, okay, I would go and drink one beer and then, allow, and then I would walk on stage with a beer. But then I was all of a sudden in this band that was really popular, this funk band that was doing three sets a night. So, I, you know, and then one night I came off stage and it was Buzzy Linhart who was hanging out with our band. I knew he'd written a number one song for Beth, Midler and I knew he played with Jimi Hendrix on his last album um, and that he was, you know, famous. And he grabbed my arm and he said, you're a great bass player. And I just sat there and I said, I sat there, I remember just my head just going blank for about five minutes. And I said, I'm never going to drink another sip for the rest of my life. And that was February 19, 1990. I had my last beer that night. And um, Buzzy it was not sober, so I mean it's interesting that that uh, ironic that that came from him. But I that, and I didn't know what was going to happen. You know, if I was going to uh, have withdrawals or have to go to AA or anything, but I, I never even thought about it again. And I've, I've been to so many AA meetings with my ex-wives and stuff like that and stuff like about 
And they, they were, you would have to talk, even though you weren't there, but you were through with somebody else. And I tell that, and, they, and every counselor said, I've never heard that before, ever. Because those people won't go to AA. I was just drinking out of total insecurity, and, that, and I, I still have some, but less, because it's just like I don't give a shit now. <laughs> it's like, like I, um, you know, I can, I'll sing on a demo, even though I'm insecure about my voice. I don't, I don't care anymore, because I know that I, I come up with good vocal ideas, you know. So, um, yeah, that was a long road. I, and the funny thing was, I was always the most outlandishly dressed and hairstyle and everything at the uh, and every, uh, all the bands I was in. I didn't look insecure, but 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 um, that 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 was that was my biggest hurdle. Yeah, just believing that I. I mean, people sent me stuff. For, I remember my first recordings. Uh, this band, the who went on to be famous, uh, the Fuzz Tones, uh, was my first band in the city. They played, uh, they were the first band to bring back that psychedelic garage rocks thing from like the right right before Hendrix came out, uh, the Shadows of Night and the Stan Mills. And that was cool. They were great. That's a great sound. But I, I recorded with them in the studio, and, he, and the guy sent me a recording recently. And I go, and I go oh, you changed the bass on it? Because I remember walking out of the studio going, I played terrible. I ruined that. He goes, No, that's you. I go, Wow. And, then, and, I, and this other band that I, from from the eighties that I said, "Damn it!" I said, I, "We worked so hard on that, and I didn't even get to redo my bass, and I, I, I made so many mistakes." And then I finally got that recording back from, from the, the the guy who played in the band, and I go, "Holy shit! I don't hear one mistake. It's like uh, that's how insecure I was, you know. It's just like I'm not good. I'm not good. I don't know. It was just in my brain. I had to get. I don't know why, um, but." Uh, uh, and, you know, I, I, I asked, we were at Radio City Music Hall once and we were, uh, we were there, the Vanilla Fudge were playing and we went backstage with Vinny, uh, FSC was there, so we got to go backstage and hang out and um, talk to this woman who, who was handled backstage and she showed us this book where everybody who had ever played there signed. And uh, we saw the, you know, when Dio played there and everything. And, uh, and, she, I, and she said, Frank Sinatra was, was very, he was, very, he and Jagger, I've read, very like nervous before they go on stage, and and, and because they had such high standards. Like I'm, I'm such a harsh critic of my of myself and and of anything that I'm doing. There's no critic's going to say be harder on me than I am on myself. I think you know. And, and uh, um, she said Sinatra would, was like you know nervous before he went on stage, uh, really stage fright, but just, I've got to be frank. Uh, the best quote that, for this, I thought, was about James Brown. He says, the hardest part about being James Brown is waking up every day, looking in the mirror and going, and being James Brown. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. so much to live up to it, because it is just what you want to be, you know, that that's, I don't know if, if you even should really get over it, but but uh, I mean I'm still I got I, if I if I'm going in just to wing it like and be make it in my own studio and play I, I feel like I'm not going to do it unless I pl play play for three hours you know before I go in it I don't I don't even want to hear myself before I've done that you know at the three hour point you know, if, you know there's a limberness that comes into your right hand uh, on the bass that, and yet I see guys pick up the bass and play. To me, I, I think you're better than I am. And they don't, and they didn't even warm up. You know, I, I don't know. It's like, um, I got riffs. That's all, that's all I know. <laughs> <laughs> that's what, I, well, you know, you're talking about the drinking. You know, there was a time where I couldn't see myself not drinking. And then after I quit, I can't see myself drinking anymore. No, the thought of having one sip makes me sick. But, yeah, it's weird, huh? I was when I quit drinking. I was in a band with five professional drinkers. Got these. If if I had two beers, I was different. You know, I mean, we'd be rehearsing. I'd drink a beer and I go, "Let's just jam." And another beer, well, let's go out. You know, <laughs> you know, these guys would 
I mean, we go on a, I was in the band that I'm talking about, the, the, the band, the Funky Nights. I played 1,035 sets with that band. Wow. It'll never happen again. <laughs> um, I mean, the Lizards played 200 concerts. That's like, I think I just read that Creedence Clearwater playing 100 gigs. That can't be real. I know Led Zeppelin played 550 concerts. Wow. But but uh, 1,035 set, sets we played in New York. The professional drinkers, these we would pick them up to go on an out-of-town gig. The singer at 11 o'clock in the morning is pouring Jack Daniels into his Pepsi bottle for breakfast, you know? And he'd get on stage, at, you know, 10 hours later, tippling all day. Uh, be clever, funny, no slurring of the words, nothing forgotten, like a, just smooth as Sinatra, you know, and funny as hell improvising. After three or four beers, I mean, I'd start to like, I mean, I would perform better. I might be spinning around with a bass over my head, but but at least in my mind, I, I couldn't, I, I felt I wasn't able to, to be my best, you know, um, I, I, and they say that if you've got a real high tolerance, that, that that's when you, that's bad. That means you're 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 maybe you're that's not a good thing, really. <laughs> yeah. I, so, but uh, yeah, I don't want to put anybody down. I know people who who can do miracles on booze, you know. But I I couldn't be the guy. I, I couldn't be the, the the leader designated driver guy that um, that I that I didn't volunteer for, but I I, I had to be it. What's what's been like the most touching thing in your moment in your life? Two things that come to mind, and it, one of them relates to to that. I I was infamous for being the guy who made my bands rehearse more than anybody, <clears throat> and I remember where I started band is that we're going to rehearse four times a week, like six hour rehearsals or else you can't be in the band. And oh, nobody had ever done that before, but they did it. And, and I, it, I was constantly heard, was made fun of for it. Um, um, Bobby Rondinelli, uh, Vinny Avesi, Carmine, go, Randy, you know nobody rehearses like this, right? I, I need it. Um, and Last time I was in New York, Bobby, this album, Ruffians 2, finished the last session before I came down out of Vegas. Um, and, and my driver in New York, he goes, Randy, I got to tell you, my playing in the Lizards, that's the best playing in my whole career. And I, I started to cry right, right in the driveway. I'm, I feel like I'm going to do it right now. <laughs> that was the most one of the most touching. He, he, was, he was a very... He was the first rock star who, who took me under his wing, you know, like he was a child star in Long Island when I grew up. I mean, he and his brother, um, you know, in local bands. And then I remember moving in the city and there he was at, at Madison Square Garden in Rainbow. I go, wow, he made it, how cool, you know? And, and it, um, yeah, that, that was very touching and when I did the album with Carmine's uh, on drums on every track, on one track, he said, I'd never played bass with Carmine. Um, I reunited Cactus and the Vanilla Fudge. I toured with him as a bass player, opening for the, the, the Fudge. But in Cactus, I was a harmonica player. So when I played bass along with Carmine track, I, he said, you sound like Tim on that track. And, I wasn't in the room, I was on the phone, but I, I started to cry. I'm a cry baby now. Since I did the interferon thing, I never used to cry about anything. I cry all the time now. Big cry baby. It's that, that thyroid thing. It did something to me. I was kind of like, <laughs> uh, very, I, I, maybe if it's at the age where you're, like, you're looking back, like you say, and, and going, like, that, that was, that was, I think those were both from drummers. <laughs> uh, and Bobby took lessons from Carmine. <laughs> Long Island Italian drummers. That's a thing. I grew up on Long Island. Uh, I played with um, Sandy Gennaro, this guy Neil 
Cecile, who's fantastic, who's on my band Rickety and has a lot of the stuff he, uh, that, that, that I have on my website. Uh, Bobby Rondinelli, Carmine Apice, Vinny Apice, John Garner, who was in that band Silver Baltimore, who you must look into Silver Baltimore. And the, the Lizards, the first two Lizards albums, he's this singer, but he's a great drummer too. Long Island, it's Brooklyn, Brooklyn's on Long Island. Right? It is. <laughs> Um, oh. I'm not yeah. I'm not that steeped into New York lore. So there's Italian, a lot of Italian drummers from New York. So I, 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 did I pick did I pick two good, good moments? That's that's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> there's been a lot of them. Robert Planchi, I mean, when this was telling me we were excellent, that was that felt good. <laughs> that one that one that I told you about, Buzzy Leonard, I mean. That, that cured me. Yeah. Um, well, that's good. That's good. I mean, it's, it changed your life for, for the better. Glenn Hughes was my ultimate idol. Trapeze is probably one of my biggest influences. They just came out with <clears throat> deluxe reissues of the no first kidding. two Trapeze albums. And it has... That band, more than any other band, and there is no other guitar player in rock that plays like Mel Galley in Trapeze. He was also in White Snake, but he didn't play like that. It's funky and it's heavy. And that's that was my, they were my, I think that started me. I, I want to be like that. And it was very brief, 70 to 72. They did two albums, Medusa and You Are the Music. It's really the funky stuff. That, that gets me uh, because the funky, heavy stuff that they do. That was that kind of was my, I would I, in a way my biggest influence. And Glenn was had just become a lead singer, and they just came out with these two deluxe versions of those albums, and last year, and there's this live, all this fantastic live stuff from '72 and. Texas on on the on the you are the music album from 1972. That's where that that was their the later where they were their best, and they're doing 14 minute versions of these songs that I've been listening to my whole life. Yeah. And my I'm sitting at home with my wife, and I'm listening, and I'm getting like conniptions, like literally, like like orgasm, this feeling like from just like oh god, you know, like just him jamming and that's both of them but the guitar player is there's I, there's nobody who plays like him he's improvising rhythm leads that are like james brown's guitars mixed with led zeppelin wild out on a limb stuff and it's just so funky and so heavy oh god amazing that that's uh and glenn came to to new york after we toured with him for six weeks and he came to New York and lived, lived with us there for a, a week and did five songs with us. He came with one song that he wrote for us and he co-wrote a couple and, and he complimented me profusely. And when I paid him, you know, when he left and he, and he cried and I, that was, it was beautiful. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 he was like somebody. I, I met him right when he got sober through my ex-girlfriend in the music business. Somehow knew him, uh, knew people who knew him, and and introduced me to him. And he just called me up one day, and I, I used to call myself Uncle Randy because it was. Uh, I remember when I heard Jim Jim Morrison called himself Jimbo when he was drunk. So I said, "Okay, I'm Uncle Randy." Like it's just some goofy name that was so un rock and roll, you know. And I hear, "Is this Uncle Randy?" And I'm going, "Yeah." And he goes, "Oh my God!" It was still like a, my head was just swimming. I mean, he was uh, uh, my biggest hero. And then we, and so we we used to talk a lot on the phone. But then he said he he, he got too so busy with his career that he had to cut himself off from the internet. So I kind of left him alone for a while. But we did. We're, we're we're still friends. I um, but I. I met Mel Galley, but I, and I, I brought him a guitar and uh, when, we, when we toured with Glenn, I bought, Glenn said he doesn't even have a guitar now. 
and I, I brought him out and that's Paul and I bought him a little Marshall that when we were in England and gave it to him and, and there's a picture of us like crying, <laughs> hugging each other on the tour bus. But I never got, he was like, Mel was the first guy I called when I started my studio. I couldn't, you know, he didn't know how I was. You know, so I'll take good care of you. you know. But Glenn came and he stayed one week with us. And that was amazing. There's some great, he said. Hmm. You know, yeah. just meeting, my, meeting my heroes and actually doing stuff with them has just been surreal. It's I, 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 Yeah, I know what I, you mean. I can't, uh, I can't, I can't just, be cool about it. I'm such a fanboy, you know. Like it's like I'm just like giddy and goofy, I'll, and I'll I'll send the, you know like I'm, I, be careful. Don't send Bumble for too many e emails. You're gonna be you know you're gonna get annoying. You know, but, but um, yeah, that's it's the way I felt when I, I got to talk to Billy Sheehan because I mean like, ever since I saw him live, I'm just it was all I could do to to keep my composure when I first started talking to him. <laughs> he is. And, and I, I remember when I discovered him, I, I'm reading uh, Bass Player Magazine. Um, they said, it talked about the band Talos uh, and yeah. said, admires Tim Bogert, Bach, and Frank Zappa. I said, holy shit. You know, anybody that mentions Tim Bogert, and there is a little bit of Bogert in there, but not, not the... Not quite as he's known too much music, I think, to be like him about it was in Cactus. Uh, but um, yeah, Talos was good, right? Talos yeah, was good, yeah, yeah. So, there's people out there that want to do something with their lives other than what they're doing, you know, stuck in a job, they haven't really pursued their dreams. What kind of advice would you give them? There is no music business anymore. Um, do it because you love to do it. Don't do it because you think you're going to make it. Or don't do it because you think you're gonna, there's money in it. Um, forget about it. It, is, it isn't what it used to be. Um, it's an addict. It has to be. A, it's an addiction now. It's it's not a living. Uh, you know what I mean. Um, I was blessed that that I came into a little bit of money, and I and I didn't have to support myself in the music, so I could do my own thing. Uh, that that was an unfair advantage that I had, you know. But um, to my credit. I didn't waste it. You know, I worked harder than anybody that I know. Um, and, you know, I, 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 uh, I was always over budget, uh, but, but um, practice, practice a lot and do it because you love it and trust your creativity and be yourself and Do what you want to do. Don't try to try to fit in something because you never will. And by the time you fit into it, it won't be in fashion anymore anyway. Um, make up a personality, and that's that'll come. That'll be you because it'll be coming out of you. And yeah, you know, I, I I kind of invented a person uh, like a superhero in my mind, <laughs> and and I feel like I like I can, I can do it now with especially. Uh, the way we're we're creating it now, where we can create with people all over the world, and they don't even have to be there in the room with you once you lay down the the basics. Uh, the technology is there to 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 do that, but that doesn't mean that you have to give up your old school learn getting your chops up. I mean, it, it, I think you got to play three hours a day, or else you're not really taking yourself seriously and that's minimum I think um, I know some guys don't have to but they did at one point in their life you know to, to get up to a level you know um, I guess my insecurity was drove me um, to be able to do what I do but 
the advice of somebody about music as a career. Uh, don't do it. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's, do it because you love it. Uh, you you could you know I mean, it, it, if you do it as a hobby, it, it'll it'll become it, it'll consume you, and it won't feel like a hobby. I guess I'm doing it as a hobby now because I'm not charging money for the music. But, you know, I'm putting it up for free on that website. So, as a hobbyist, I'm like insanely consumed by it. You know, got to get my wife some something too. Uh, as a matter of fact, do you, to... do you have your own website? Yes, hyperspacerecords.com. Oh, that is your website. <laughs> That's a new website. I put up pretty much everything that I've done on there, uh, but that's been actually released as a CD. But I've got tons of backlog stuff coming now, like the next two Ruffians albums are already finished. And then I've got two funky Ruffians albums coming out. I have to think of another name for that, but I've got James Brown's horn section on it. Uh, I, I can't believe you pinch me. That's to me, that's 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 more weirdly mind-blowing than than the uh, than even having the, the rock guys on it because i don't know anybody who can say that i, I don't know anybody else you know uh, but um when you hear my funky side uh, i'm all sending you, I, I, that stuff's not up there yet but I, i'll send it to you oh cool you email me i'll send you the record i've got i've got and then i said the black sabbath uh james brown thing i got bobby Ron Danelli, who played on a great Black Sabbath album and did the longest Black Sabbath tour and has a DVD of them live. So he's a Black Sabbath drummer legitimately with James Brown's horn section. And, oh, you know, it's, <laughs> um, and it's, it's, it makes us good. <laughs> um, mm. But that'll be that, that'll be coming out soon. I got to think of a cool name for that band. I, I, the Funky Nights. I can't even though some of it is my old band with Ed singing um, and James Brown's and the, the horn player Fred Wesley, who was also he was also the the band leader for Parliament Funkadelic's best five albums. I mean, he's a mm -hmm. god. This guy, you, James Brown. He was he was the band leader during James Brown's best period from six, you know, during the. 69 to 75 when he was was getting guitar oriented stuff and really funky and uh you look you see on uh, youtube a lot of that uh, soul train there's a lot of live james brown on soul train there's a paris concert um with bootsy uh, and everything like that but oh yeah uh, mike Love douglas Bootsy. mike douglas show too so yeah that that's um that, that's going to be on the website soon now i gotta press i gotta send you that and I, oh, I gotta get something out on the website because I've been talking about here. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be sweet. When people tell me release one song, and I and so I release a double album. You know, it's like <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna put a stuff out one song as a release. <laughs> <laughs> do you have social media? There's a, a hyperspace records Facebook page that has a link to the to the video. Uh, that we have for the Ruffians 2 album, which is killer. The video is killer. This guy is a great video guy. Um, it's the first year that they've had the 3D effect that he has that uh, that we have on that. So it's, it looks good. And uh, there's a link to that video and there's a link to the website on the Hyperspace Records Facebook page. And if you join that page, then you'll get blogs we put out and stuff like that. Okay. It's just the. Uh... Just Facebook, or do you have like Instagram and all that other stuff? I'm, I'm, I'm going to do that. Uh, I just some guy on online contacted me about about some posts that I did, and, and he's in England, and he's a fan of of the. Of, of, he's my fan now, and he, <laughs> he he wants to help me promote with uh, with um, Instagram, Instagram, and then a kid I met here in Vegas is. Uh, his he and his roommate does Stooge Knight. He's like the West Coast king of rap, hip hop. He does his Instagram. So 
it, it must be high shot on Instagram. I mean, it's going to try to see what happens, putting this old, old classic rock man stuff out. With <laughs> James Brown's horn section. Hey. <laughs> hey, we're not dead yet. No, we ain't dead yet. <laughs> Don't bury us. We thank you, Randy, for coming on the show. Uh, I really appreciate your time and also want to thank all of you out there. If you are new to the channel, um, please come back, hit that subscribe button for my regulars out there. Thank you for your support because of you that I get to do this. So until the next one, everyone, please take care. Be kind to one another. God bless and peace. Just